सो टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस अबाउट द मैनेजमेंट ऑफ नेचुरल रिसोर्सेज सो रिसोर्स क्रंच और डेफिशिएंसी इन रिसोर्स इज अ प्रॉब्लम फेस नॉट जस्ट बाय आवर कंट्री बट ऑलमोस्ट ऑल नेशंस अक्रॉस द ग्लोब सो आर रिसोर्सेज आर नॉट अनलिमिटेड देर इज अ लिमिट फॉर द रिसोर्सेज एस्पेशली द नेचुरल रिसोर्सेज सो वी नीड टू यूज इट एफिशियंटली एंड इफेक्टिवली एंड कंजर्व इट फॉर द फ्यूचर जनरेशन सो देर इज अ सेंग दैट वी हैव नॉट इनहेरिटेड द अर्थ from the forefathers but we have rather borrowed it from our future generation so it is our moral responsibility to protect and preserve the resources for the coming generation now the basic thing we need to have is the awareness so this awareness has been of recent origin the concept of sustainable development or efficient use of resources has emerged in the middle of 1970s when there were so much concern about the environmental problems happening so basically people need to understand at all levels be it national regional or even local levels people need to understand the importance of con- conserving the environment so in this picture you can see how a program has changed the life of a river so the river ganga which originates somewhere in the himalayan glaciers is so pure in its himalayan course but when it comes to the plains of north india there is so much dumping of the waste that has literally made the made the river unsustainable for the normal use so there was a study and the river water contained a disease causing bacteria so after that people began began to understand the importance of conservation so there was a program called ganga action plan which was initiated as early as 1986 by the then prime minister rajiv gandhi so in this uh, program the river flo- the ganga river ganga flows mainly through five states the states of uttarakhand the present day uttarakhand and uttar pradesh bihar west bengal and even a smaller part of jharkhand so in all these states there were committees set up at all levels the national level state level and even the local level so the, this program is presently known as the mami ganga program initially when uh, the then prime minister rajiv gandhi started it was called as national action plan on river ganga now the it ha- the name has changed and now under the leadership of the present prime minister narendra modi it has been changed to the mami ganga program and there is a separate executive wing for its implementation so there has been a lot of improvement happening the basic aims of national action plan on ganga was to control the pollution and make the water to a bathable quality so the basically it was to give life to the river ganga so now there has been tremendous changes after the program the program was started in 1986 now coming on to uh, 2020 nearly 24 years has passed and there is a drastic improve, improvement in the quality though it though much is required to be done but still the condition is much better than what it was before so it all happened as a part of awareness so this program is not just by the government but also there was coordination uh, of people as well so every environmental issue cannot be seen as something that government has to take action for the action is required at all levels including the stakeholders when i say stakeholders i mean the people who are closely associated with now when come to national action plan on ganga the ganga as you all knows the holy river and it's also the national river of india so now there are lot of stakeholders people mainly come as a purpose of pilgrimage so they have also a responsibility that this river is preserved in its most pristine form so the awareness is the most important or the first step towards the conservation now the most important principle of conservation is the 3r principle that is 
reuse reduce and recycle now the ncert has added two more that is refuse and repurpose it so the earlier concept was re reuse reduce and recycle now we will uh, see each of these terms so first is the reuse so what do you mean by reuse reuse means you are using the same things like we have discussed about non biodegradable waste so in non biodegradable waste what happens is these waste you cannot simply throw it because the normal natural bacteria or microbes will not degrade it so what you need is you have to the most um, the most convenient way to conserve it would be to reuse it the most example is the plastic the plastic uh, plastic bottles which we buy or we get can be reused like to store certain things in the kitchen etc so this is one example how can be reuse now the thing is to reduce now we all know that uh, resource is limited so what we can do is we can uh, reduce the use of it for example um, you can just uh, turn off the pipe when you see water flowing so that is one way of reducing the wastage now when you come out of your room you can switch off the light because electricity is also uh, made through a very expensive process you require water and many other processes so in that way you can reduce the wastage of energy now recycle also recycle is also the most a uh, suited way for plastic kind of materials which are not biodegradable so in recycle uh, you can use the plastic to make something else and reuse it so that is the concept of three r principle now there is something called repurpose now what is repurpose is uh, the something which has an original purpose you are using it for something else for example like you had a plastic bottle and it cracked you cannot use it now what can you do you can use it to grow some smaller plants etc or you can use it to feed the animals or something like that instead of throwing it off so that is called the purpose now you can uh, refuse that is refuse to take the things which are harmful for the environment that is the first is to understand basically you should understand what is harmful now i'll tell you an example this is not mentioned in the ncert there is a country there is an island country called palau so this country had banned sunscreen because the sunscreen was made up of made up using uh, the algal or the coral reefs so the coral reef is facing such a huge a uh, problem of coral bleaching that this country decided to ban it now they are refusing to take it so that is also one way of conserving the environment so it can be any see all uh, methods cannot be suited for one but certain things can be suited for certain purpose so re mainly plastic materials you can uh, re recycle and reuse and also you can refuse so you can refuse then uh, other thing would be going back to ink pens and all like we all use mostly the plastic pen so plastic has you know captured uh, as in almost all spheres of life that it it has become we have reached a stage where we cannot live without these plastics so it is our duty to understand that what are the harms it can cause and now other thing is that you must have uh, heard now the government is also taking some initiative in this regard government has banned single use plastic like the carry bags so when uh, a shopkeeper gives you you can refuse it or you can take your own bag and carry the things in that that would be one first step from your part for the conservation of the environment so understand these concept in a broader perspective this is not just for uh, this class uh, 10 ncert level but this is something which you need to understand all throughout your life and something you should pass on to the next generation that where to dispose the waste and how to utilize the resources in the best possible way so this is the 3r principle now coming on to why should we conserve the resources so mahatma gandhi has once said that there is enough for every man's need in this nature but there is too little for everyone's greed so our resources are very much limited but the population has increased to such an 
extent that there is fight for these limited natural resources and apart from that over exploitation you are over exploiting like um, especially this happens in case of minerals when you over exploit it it affects the ground water so over exploitation uh, can lead to more damage for the environment so just understand that the nature the resources are very much limited and it is our duty to conserve it in the best possible way now we will study about sustainable management towards the end so now let's focus on the forest and wildlife now forests are so important because they are the biodiversity hotspots now biodiversity hotspot in it itself is an uh, it's a bigger uh, idea or a global globally significant term which we don't need to study at this point but just understand that whenever you visit a forest area the organisms are so diverse you see a lot of organisms organisms beat plants or animals so a lot of organism will be there so the that is why here they have used the term biodiversity hotspot we can see organism ranging from bacteria fungi to higher plants and also similarly from the smaller level of organisms like the nematodes to uh, reptiles and even the mammals so that is forest and wildlife now there are uh, various laws the government has implemented laws for the conservation of wildlife as well as forest so we have something called forest conservation act of 1980 in this act the government has kept that a particular area of the land of the state needs to be a forest area itself so and also there are there are laws to conserve wildlife like the wildlife protection act under which we have uh, wildlife sanctuaries and national park to protect the wildlife now when we talk about forest we should understand who are the stakeholders of the forest now the first category i would say is the people people who take care of these forests or people who totally dependent on who are totally dependent on these forests for example the tribal people so these people are the most important stakeholders so these people have the access to the forest produces government has made provision for that as well now there are the forest department as well and there are industrialist also so these industrialist also take uh, materials from the forest it can be uh, it can be the big trees uh, for some industrial purpose or any other produce which can be uh, used for uh, with further modification and also so it has to be protected when a forest laws or when a forest act or any initiatives are made not only just in forest but in any other sector the stakeholders need to be uh, addressed their demand their concern also we should take care of so the most important uh, fact is about the tribal people so these tribal people are totally dependent on the forest so and they uh, they protect the forest and uh, they are, that, that is into their blood and uh, into their veins that protection and conservation of uh, forest which they live in they respect it they worship it it's a part of their traditional belief as well so the they are the major stakeholders and there are other stakeholders so all these people should work in coordination then only we can conserve the resources in a better way now i'll tell you the story which is the most inspiring story i would say about the bishnoi movement so bishnois are a group of uh, A, a sect i would say that live in the western part of the rajasthan so now you know that the rajasthan has a major portion of rajasthan especially the desert part of the rajasthan is uh, sorry is desert the western part is majorly desert so in this region they preserve a particular tree called kejri tree so now what is the significance of this tree is that it is a part of their cultural belief uh, so they expect like before they construct their houses or before they start anything new they go and uh, pray under this tree and it is also believed that the pandavas while on their exile they kept their weapons under this tree so that is a part of you know folklore also and apart from that the most important fact that is the ecological aspect of this tree now you know the rajasthan comes in the desert region especially the western part so this tree can survive in such 
extreme condition so and this tree produces a fruit called sangri so this particular fruit can help these people thrive in such a drought conditions as well so they make use of the fruit and uh, make the flour or they eat it also so this tree and its fruit are so important for these people and apart from that these people are known for their attitude towards environment now you must have heard about salman khan's case the salman khan who um, who was recent who was convicted in 2018 uh, for killing the black buck so it is these people who fought this case for nearly 20 years so this case had happened way back in 1997 when he came there to shoot a film but he um, killed two black bucks and these people fought against him and uh, finally the court had sentenced him so you have to remember that it is their effort it is their attitude it is their passion for the environment that has led to it people have often forgotten it we remember that salman khan is sentenced and media make it so much big news but it is actually this bishnoi people or the bishnoi community that fought for this case for nearly 20 years imagine the people who are without any privilege is fighting um, a star as huge as him now coming to our part of study there was a movement called the bishnoi movement so what happened that in uh, 1730s there was a king called abhay singh he 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 wanted to construct a new palace so to construct the new palace he wanted to cut the skejri tree so he sent his people to cut the tree and there was this lady called amrita devi along with her three daughters they just came and embraced this tree so after that they their heads were cut off and after in the subsequent days nearly as much as 363 people joined this movement and this movement in fact became an inspiration for the later movement of chip chipko movement which is hailed as one of the first environmental movement that happened in our country so remember this tribe they believe that uh, the right of the environment is also so much ingrained or so much part of their life that it is their duty and they themselves say that nobody should teach a bishnoi child how to conserve they see it all their life so this is such an inspiring story of a community who have dedicated their entire life for saving the environment now coming on to the next case study this has happened uh, in uh, the great himalayan national park so this great himalayan national park is known for meadows it's known for uh, short grass now what happened was that th there used to be nomadic shepherds see the winter in the northern part especially in the uh, himachal region and in the kashmir region it's very strong so what happens is they come through the plains now these shepherds they used to often migrate from one part to the other they come with their sheep now in this part what the government has done is they decided you know when this national park was created there is restriction for people to enter that is a part of law like in the national park you have something called core zone there people cannot enter at all so when this national park was created what happened is the normal the nomads who used to be there the tribes who used to come with their uh, sheep Uh, could not enter this national park area now what happened was that uh, because the sheep were not there to graze the grass grew in height so the usually there used to be small grass but now the grass increased in height to certain extent to such an extent and what happened was that once they fall off they fall off all together so after that it looks barren there won't be any fresh growth of grass now this is one problem this has really uh, affected the life there so that is that is that is where there is a conflict between uh, development and environment so we need to find the balance between the two our development should be the ideas of our development should be in correlation with the needs of the environment and in correlation with the times of the environment times and needs of the environment 
now there is another story this has happened in arbari district this is in west bengal so this is about ak banerji and villagers they were involved in the protection of around 1 to 7 to hectares of badly degraded forest so in it is a collaboration between government and people so in return the uh, these people were given jobs in government sectors so that is also one way where we could involve people and uh, conserve the environment remember the uh, the basic or the fundamental um, units we could say are the local people because they understand the geography better they know the climate better so they know what can be grown there what cannot be grown there so it is very very important that whatever plan we make at all levels at state level or even at the local panchayat or municipality or whatever levels you may it is very important that you incorporate the stakeholders or the local people this is one such example where the collaboration between a government and the local people have become successful and this much hectare is not a small area 1 to 7 to hectares of land are being conserved just by the efforts of people and the government so this is how the government and people can work together for the efficient management of our natural resources now coming on to the uh, importance of forest conservation we need to accept that the human intervention has been very much part of the forest landscape so what has to be managed in nature and the extent of this intervention so the forest resource, resources ought to be used in a manner that it is developmentally sound or in other words while the environment is preserved the benefits of uh, this exploitation should go to the local people there were many convention at international levels also they have over the years acknowledged the contribution that local people have made to the uh, to the conservation of environment if you could cite an example example in our um, in our place we have seen something called sacred groves or the uh, cow we say so this cow or sacred groves have contributed to the development or to the development or the conservation of many indigenous trees so there will be a house and associated with that there will be a grove so this grove itself will have so many trees and this trees will promote many birds butterflies and it will form an ecosystem in itself so promotion of sacred grove also can be uh, one one way of conserving natural resources or the forest conservation now the uh, uh, idea is to have a balance between the development as well as uh, the needs that the problems that environment faces today so first is as we saw in the beginning we need to have an awareness of what the problems actually are and what are the steps that we need to take and the steps should not be like it should not be for any kind of vested interest like uh, sometimes the government also tend to lean for the industrialist so uh, the problem is that there should be an understanding of the geography of a region so uh, without understanding the geography of region it will be very difficult to form a development plan so and whatever we plan it should be in the most efficient way so that the environment is not hampered and the resources are also conserved with the optimum use so now let us come to the conservation of water india is basically a monsoon country so india receives a rainfall during the monsoon but this rainfall is not regular when i say it's not regular i mean that one part of india will receive more rain while the other part will not receive it for example in the parts of western ghats like in the states of kerala especially and karnataka goa maharashtra you have seen in the last years we have experienced flood for two years because we receive huge amount of rainfall in the month of june july uh, august and september so and there are other regions that is parts of tamil nadu andhra pradesh telangana and uh, in, into the odisha to some extent these region do not re receive adequate rainfall so our rainfall pattern is not regular 
so because of that there is a need to uh, divert water from water rich region to those region which have deficiency of it similarly if you see we have two types of rivers the rivers that flow from the himalayas now in himalayas all throughout the years the ice will be melting the glaciers will be melting so these rivers will have water all throughout the year but when you come to the peninsula region peninsula region is those region um, parts of uh, karnataka maharashtra all that region these region do not require do not have this kind of ice or glaciers so the water there is seasonal now there is deficiency of water in one part there is plenty of water in the other part now we have to make use of all these so there are various processes various um, initiatives like interlinking of rivers that is interlinking a himalayan river with a peninsula river so that the problem of water plentiness is equated with the problem of water deficiency so the aim is to ensure water for all now water is so much important why it is important because our country is still dependent on agriculture so though we have moved on with new sectors like services still a majority of our population depend upon agriculture so for agricultural purposes we require water for irrigation and also water is also important in other sectors like for industries also there are certain plants which require like sugar cane it require huge amount of water so those industries um, that and we make uh, industries use it industries themselves cultivate it so for industrial purpose also we require water and for our daily life normal use also we require water and agriculture is also so important uh, for the survival of the economy as well as the lives also so we need water for all these purposes and because of that the water need to be used efficiently now irrigation um, has been there since centuries or even from the ancient india like if we go back to history also we can see that there were many kingdoms who made use of uh, this uh, irrigation and grew into rich empires if you have if you have an idea about the history you can understand that the most of the flourishing kingdoms for example there was a kingdom called magadha this kingdom was flourishing on the bank of river ganga so magadha became such a huge kingdom because of because of its rich resource it was also a resource rich region and also there were water available for the agricultural purpose now if you uh, see the present day condition also you can see the most populated regions of india will be those living in the banks of river ganga and the yamuna so water is so much important this all these shows how important water is now how can we conserve this water there are various methods which has been used from times immemorial and still we make use of this ancient technology and also we have some modern technology so sometimes there is a mix of both sometimes there still prevails the ancient ancient system or somewhere we have a new system as well so it is a mix of all but the basic aims is to ensure that water is supplied for the basic needs so the first would be to construction of dams now dams are constructed for two important purpose one is for the irrigational purpose and secondly it is to create electricity so you know that electricity is generated uh, by turning the turbines of the generator so uh, because of that water is stored in the dam so basically dams are constructed for these two purposes there are many dams in india and also in kerala also we have so many dams so these dams now what are the problems associated with this dam is that whenever you construct a dam sometimes the natural the normal vegetation there over there had to be cut off so that is one problem and also there will be these people will be uh, there will be people who have been living in that area so that people need to be rehabilitated so equally important is that their life right to life and that to live with a live with dignity as well so it is important that the government makes steps 
to ensure that they also have their rights to life so this is one major issue when you have to construct a dam the people have to be evacuated from there and they are left sometimes homeless for years and years so rehabilitation is one major issue uh, faced while the construction of dam and also sometimes there are vested interests people who take in charge the especially the private partnership when they come um, to construct the dam it is not constructed often with a proper quality so uh, it is not constructed with a proper quality then that will also it will not be stable for many years so then will be issues like see suppose a dam burst it can uh, flood the uh, low lying areas so that was very important when you construct the dam you have to uh, take adequately take care of the safety measures so if a dam explodes it it can kill more people than a bomb blast so it in itself is a, a bomb you can say so uh, the dam needs to be constructed with proper safety measures so that is one important thing that the government need to take care of now and coming on to the uh, water harvesting now you might have often seen uh, about uh, this uh, we harvest rain water so that is usually seen in household also we have and also in government uh, offices also now even private uh, offices they encourage rain water harvesting now watershed management is basically as i said it is to divert the rivers like there are rivers which Uh, have plenty of water and there are rivers which do not have now it creates a linkage between all to ensure a adequate supply of water this is the basic aim of watershed management it not only take care of the need of water conservation along with that it uh, you know it take care of the needs of the soil in a scientific way that is it is important equally important to prevent soil erosion when the fertile soil is eroded then it affects the growth of vegetation as well so watershed management uh, incorporates all these it incorporates the concept of water conservation as well as the effective management of soil and to develop a system in harmony with the ecology so and the advantage is that you have seen that there are uh, areas which flood like in uh, areas of northeast india it floods almost every year you hear the stories of brahmaputra the river brahmaputra which flows through the assam so this assam is a plain region so every year almost this uh, part floods now there are you might have heard about farmers committing suicide in the vidarbha part also in maharashtra so these are severe drought prone area so it is like an uh, it is so much paradoxical or it is so much what i can say uh, ironical you can uh, that one part is flooding and other part is dr having drought so the aim of watershed management is to have a balance between the two to we don't either want to have a flood also we don't want to have a drought as well so watershed management will ensure that there is adequate supply of water to every part now uh, let us remember study these are just very factual which may be asked as one mark question these are just name sake like i said water harvesting system was is not a new concept it always existed uh, from ancient india so for example you can see kadans thangs and nadis in the rajasthan region and there are bandharas and thals in the maharashtra region then bundis in madhya pradesh and uttar pradesh region you have ahars in bihar then khuls in himachal pradesh pons in the jammu region then eris in or tangs in the tamil nadu then surangams in kerala and kattas in karnataka so these are just for name sake only they are nothing but the water harvesting system just like we have rain water harvest harvesting system today there were many other structures right from the ancient india so you just remember all these names uh, by heart it may be asked as a one mark question uh, for the exam so just remember for the sake of that just by heart it nothing else to explain in that so ancient water harvesting systems now what is check dam check dams are relatively a smaller dam so why are they constructed they are constructed uh, one is to avoid the erosion so it is mainly constructed in a high, high terrain region that is high lands so that uh, it prevents the erosion of water 
also now um, then uh, another important advantage of creating check dam is to recharge the ground water that is beneath so why is the why is it so much important to recharge or preserve ground water the advantages of ground water stored are many it the thing is it does not evaporate but it spreads out to recharge the wells and provides moisture for the vegetation over an area in addition to that it does not provide breeding ground for mosquitoes like the stagnant water you might have observed mosquitoes coming and breeding there in the um, unclean water you could say the stagnant water stagnant is the water which does not flow so unlike that the ground water will not um, allow the mosquitoes to breed as well it provides water and moisture for the vegetation for the trees it also recharges the wells now the ground water is also uh, protected like the surface water will have all the human and the animal waste especially the urine or the excreta but ground water is so uh, pure that it will not contain any of these so that that is why we need to preserve ground water now uh, another thing is uh, another source uh, resource which needs to be managed is coal and petroleum so we have seen in the chapter evolution about fossils so these fossils these coals and the petroleum are a part of these remains okay so these remains is the like the biomass like when an organism ever since life existed the organism have lived and died so their part once they are dead they will be decomposed by the microorganisms so these microorganisms uh, after the decomposition they will become a part of the soil or they will become a part of uh, what i say this they will become a biomass and that is how the coal and petroleum are formed now these coal and petroleum the we have been using it since years and the reserve is not unlimited so now we need to think of alternate option so we need now like we have these are like what i say is this exhaust in a while so we need resources we need to make use of the resources that can be used for a longer term for example solar energy so we need to go for all that source of energy so that uh, the resources can be utilized in a better way now the coal uh, coal is a huge reservoir now other problem with coal and petroleum is that they when they get burned what is released is carbon dioxide now you know the gas carbon dioxide will uh, increase the temperature uh, though that is what is called the global warming so the carbon dioxide in itself has the tendency to increase the temperature other problem is if the coal is not properly burned it create a gas called carbon monoxide and now this carbon monoxide gas is very much dangerous uh, because it causes pollution and it is very much harmful to the blood Uh, it very much harmful to your respiratory system because as i we have seen that in the blood there is a pigment called hemoglobin this hemoglobin we have discussed that it has an affinity with both oxygen and carbon dioxide but the affinity of hemoglobin to carbon monoxide is way higher than both oxygen and carbon dioxide so that is how it becomes so harmful so when we why should why should we limit the use of coal and petroleum is that one factor is that these resources are very much limited and if we are not taken adequate steps now the resource will exhausted in some time and the other problem is that it releases when it gets burned it releases a gas called carbon dioxide and this carbon dioxide will increase the heating capacity of the earth so then what that is called global warming so uh, and apart from that it affects your respiratory system so all these are all these things we should consider and hence we should make judicial use of these two resources now coming on to the most important and the most significant part of this chapter that is sustainable development now what is sustainable development as i said in the beginning there is resources are limited and also it is important that we hand over the earth as it is to the next generation as well now what sustainable management aims that it is a development 
which takes care take care of the needs of the present without compromising the needs of the future generation understand the concept it takes care of the need it doesn't mean that you don't need development presently but the development uh, should not hamper with the needs of the future that is the main aim of sustainable management now the concept of sustainable development was um, also dates back to 1975 when there were many conferences as i said in the beginning there was a person called brundtland who introduced the term of sustainable uh, development now the un has taken up this issue uh, seriously and it has come up with millennium goals in 2000 now it has come up uh, with what is called sustainable development goals or the sdg goals so i have given a picture of all the sdg goals there are basically uh, 17 goals the aim is to reduce or eliminate or eradicate poverty hunger and also to provide quality education and health and also let the people live in sustainable cities so and ensuring them the adequate supply of water and other resources and also incorporating the values of environmental conservation so these sustainable development basically uh, is a balanced growth balanced growth idea you can say so these sustain it is only to su- only through sustainable development that we can um, we can restore or we can conserve the earth and its resources and utilize in a efficient and effective manner